Uh, like I said, I, we're going to just kind of skip video and dive right into things. I'm, I'm really wanting to jump in as we could go into basically what's going to be the last week, quote unquote, of the Beyond Church study that we have been in. Again, if you've been around, I see a couple faces uh, that we need to catch up a little bit. But we've been in the season and continue to be in a season called Mobilize, which I really feel God is leading us to focus in on us as individuals making up the church being mobilized in the mission of Christ. Again, if you've accepted Jesus as leader and forgiver in your life, in other words, if you've acknowledged with your mouth he's the son of God, you believe in your heart, he died and rose again, you've repented of the old life and you're following him now, then we are called to lead others to the Lord, to baptize others, to disciple others in a very mindful, purposeful, daily, moment by moment way. And that's really been the heart of Beyond Church, of looking at these different sections that kind of encourage us or empower us to be able to do so in our calling. Uh, we also talked about passion. When we talked about having the passion of God through the Holy Spirit, we looked at Pentecost, which if I remember correctly, Pentecost is next week. So woo, we get double hit that sucker. I'm enjoying that. Love Pentecost. Uh, we've looked at things as well like uh, being authentic, being the people that we say that we are, living by the beliefs that we say we believe, holding on to the promises that we believe of God, and then also being able to be, uh, again, capable, being equipped for this role, courage, having the courage and the boldness, being principled, and then last week, also we talked about hope. I'm gonna get a drink of this. If anybody needs some, just let me know. <laughs> I'll some coughing on this side, I, I'll share. Um, and last week we talked about hope, and that, that's, again, just living by that, hope and that knowledge, not like a wish, but the knowledge that you and I have an eternity with Christ, that we have an eternity in heaven, and then not only in the future, but now, that we have a relationship with Him now, that we can choose whether or not we're going to plug into and follow Him before we keep trying to do shortcuts that the world tries to offer to us. And then also we have, uh, you know, just hope that we can be made a difference in somebody else's life, that we can lead others to the Lord as well. But today we're going to change the focus off of us as individuals and come back to talking about us working as a team. Because we are designed, as we have seen over and over again, and we're going to see again today, made to be collaborative. If you've been taking notes of the different things that we're talking about, that's your little buzzword for the day. We are made to work together. We are made to be a body, not just for encouragement of one another and having good relationships and having good you know, time on Sunday mornings, but we're made to work together together. So that's what we're going to look at more deeply today as we go to Acts chapter 6. So we continue our study here on being collaborative and what that looks like and why it's so important and what your part within it is. So we're going to Acts chapter 6 and as I've said before we have been looking at two primary things in Luke's writing. Luke has been going back and forth as we talked about last week between this is what the, the Christian b believers look like in the early church. This is what it was like when they were by themselves. This is what it was like when they went into the world doing the mission. Over here, things have been up to chapter 5, great. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were uh, devoted to taking and helping each other. No one had a need. I'd sell my la extra land to give you money. Well, I'd actually take the money to the apostles' feet, and then the apostles would take and distribute the money. But no one had a need. Everybody was doing their part. Up until, again, chapter 5, we saw what happens when people decide to go their own route instead of God's route and the turmoil that that causes. But for the most part up to this point, it's been really, really good. Then when they go into the world, we see two things happen. We see a growing persecution going on. They're being arrested. They're being uh, held in prison overnight unless God decides to let them out early. Right? We looked at that last week. We uh, looked at them being threatened. We saw them getting beaten to the pulp last week. So the persecution is continuing. But we also see very purposefully in the text that more and more people are coming to the Lord. And I don't mean like there was 3,000 that first day, which was really cool. And then we got five more and 10 more and 12 more. It's saying more and more, 3,000 this day. And they even got more than that the next day. And even more than that was coming to the Lord the next day. And then both men and women said last week, you're just coming in droves to the Lord, even though they had to take hits to be able to do the ministry that they're called to do. And so what we're going to find this week is that things have continued to explode and get bigger and bigger and bigger. Now they're starting to have some unique challenges within the community. And that, that's, that's very commonplace. We, we, we've kind of gone through the same things. We love some of the changes that God led us through over the last couple of years, but there's also times that we had to scramble <laughs> to, to, be able to, to be able to accommodate those things. Or, you know, that's why all this stuff's going on around you is to be able to scramble to accommodate those things. But even bigger than that, how do we continue doing ministry without getting 
you know, clogged up with this growth stuff is a big challenge that. And that's what they were dealing with as we get into this section today. So read with me if you would. We're going to be part of this and kind of babble about it. But verse 1 says, In these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenist arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So what this is talking about is an early church practice that wasn't just here, but it's continued through the writings of the New Testament, probably the, for the, at least the first century, if not longer, where there was what's called a list of widows. And if you're on the list of widows, the church took care of you. Daily they would give you food, they would help you out with clothing, they would help you with different needs because you didn't have means for income. But just because you're a widow does not mean you're on the list of widows. Paul gives us an additional information as we go into the New Testament that if you are a young widow, let's say you're in your late teens or your 20s, maybe early 30s, then you would not be on the list of widows because the assumption in the culture at that time is soon you'll be courting someone else, maybe someone within the family following their structure, and that they will be providing for you, and that family provides for you. Uh, if you are an older widow, that doesn't necessarily mean that you automatically get on the list of widows either. According to Paul, if you have family, your family takes care of you. And these are some of the principles we still use today with the Stephen Fund. That one of the things that, that when someone comes and says, hey, I have this need, and they have family and they have resources, Paul says, don't put them on the list because they should not be using the resources of the church because there's others who do not have that benefit that need those resources. And family needs to take care of family. There's a really strong calling in that as well. So in this case, what we have are older widows who have nobody else to take care of them or a family who's refusing to be godly and take care of them. And so what we have is we have these groups within all, you know, all the, the, the believers out here where these Greek-speaking Christians, the Hellenists, are, are seeing that their widows are not being taken care of because all the, all the help's going on over here. And so they really have a choice whenever there's a, something falling through the cracks within the church community of either becoming us versus them and resentment and talk and things growing up to be more and more or take that frustration, take it to the leaders because they might not even been seeing this at this point and saying, hey, we've got a concern. This is not right that these guys are getting taken care of and these guys aren't. And so when they came to the leaders to give that to them, the, then the, the leaders had a decision to deal with. And I really believe, and forgive me for being wrong, and I'm not trying to down the church as a whole, but in our day and age today, I think if this situation came to most church leadership teams, they would say, hey, it's not right that they're being overlooked. And that's a good thing, right? I, I think be, it's not right for them to be overlooked, so let's stop, you're with the leaders, let's stop, and we're going to stop over here, and we're going to take a couple months, and we're going to come up with a new program. We're going to come up with a campaign drive to get more resources. We're going to take and come up with a better system so that everybody's taken care of, and we're going to knock this out. And that makes sense to us, doesn't it? However, the apostles were focused on God's vision and had a different response that I think is much more mature and also much more complex. Look what this says in verse 2. The twelve of the apostles, the leadership, summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. How people respond to that right off the bat? You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, that makes sense, but I mean, serve tables, you kind of like, it seems like you're downing the situation, but I don't think they were. It says, therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the entire gathering. In other words, they didn't say that's, that's a situation, that's just a physical thing. You know, we're going to all be dead in 50 years anyways. Let's forget about that. Who cares? We're all just about saving people. That's all we're all about. Everybody get out there and save people. And if you don't have money, then just go deal with it. Get a job. That's not what they did. What they said to us, this is an important problem, yes. But that's not what we're called to take care of. That's not our place. Our place is to go out and teach and lead people to the Lord and continue this ministry. And what they recognize is sometimes, sometimes Satan uses good people and good situations that seem to make sense to stop us from the focus on the mission that we're called to. Does that make sense? They said, well, we're not going to stop doing what we're doing, but this is an important problem. So do me a favor, find seven men who love the Lord, they're above repute. This is the beginning of disciples in the scripture, and you bring them to us, and we'll confirm, we'll, we'll, if they are above repute, 
We'll appoint them, and they can take care of this need, and they can knock it out. And everybody's taken care of. The, the need's taken care of, but we're not stopping doing the ministry. Because what they realize is that we're not all made the same. That we all have a particular shape, like we talked about when we first started talking about this. We talked about calling. You are made different than me, and it's a good thing. And so the apostles had their ability to teach, their, their ability to do the miracles, their ability to serve the Lord in that particular way. But looking at some of them and how they handle situations, some of them were not the best at bedside manner. Okay? Those of them were not caregivers. They weren't made that way. So you go find seven guys who maybe they can't get up in front of everybody else and preach. Maybe they can't take and teach a class because that's just not what they're made to do. But they love people. They want to help people. They love the Lord. Find those guys and raise them up so we can empower them so that all of this is taken care of. That's how we work. That's what we are made to be. And again, I've said this a billion times. I, I was I, in my 20s. I really believed the, the whole junk of I can be a Christian and not go to church. But the, the reality of it is that does not match up to the scripture. If I want to be the fullest of who God has created me to be and have the fullness of what God wants for me, I am created to be in church community and to be collaborative, working together, making a difference. Well, look what happens here in verse 7. This is the result of that decision. It says, And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great number of who? Priests <laughs> became obedient to the faith. Now we see a little bit of, little bit of verse, not a lot, but these people that were threatening them last week are now coming to the Lord through what continues to happen because the apostles did not stop doing the apostle work, and the caregivers started doing the caregiver work. It would have been a disaster for the apostles to stop and deal with the physical need instead of empowering others. I remember, I'll just throw this in, about seven years ago, we went through a very tough time here at the church. I really believe out of our 10 years, our first three years was almost a completely separate thing than what God's been doing the last seven years, that we needed to learn lessons and take some hits. And I remember when we went through that situation, getting up here and just looking at the story of Moses in the Old Testament when he was trying to judge everything and try to take care of all the daily problems and his father-in-law showed up and said look this is not good you're getting bogged down in everything raise other people up that can deal with with the day-to-day -day stuff and you keep going on what you're supposed to be doing in the Lord and I needed to learn that lesson uh, that, uh, a bit, part of that chunk of that first three years was me trying to do everything it's just not my role I'm to preach I'm to teach I'm to love on you guys and equip you guys to do ministry and for us to do ministry together. Does that make sense? And as we look at that, there's a, there's a scripture that's been coming out. I don't know if you've noticed it. In all honesty, it's not been planned, but I noticed it this week as I was going back to it. I was like, man, I'd like to use the scripture, but it seems like we talked about it last week. And I started going through my notes. It's like, seems like we talked about this thing four times already. So you guys are probably done with it. Uh, I'm not. So we're going to put it up on the screen for you. It's Ephesians 4. And I went back and I was watching part of the, the first week when we started this. And this was one of the keynote scriptures. It says, speaking the truth in love, we, the community, are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with each it is equipped, with it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself in love. That we are designed for this. This is what we're called to do. And this is one of the mentalities, that not necessarily off this set of verses, another verse we're about to go through in Revelations, but um, this really is a big chunk of why I really felt God was calling us to do the fellowship, is because we needed, um, not we like Mary and like we're the only church that matters, but just we really had this focus on doing this together, of living this together, working this together. And one of the first things that we did is we looked at, you know, do we have membership or do we not have membership? I grew, grew up in American Baptist churches. We had membership. Um, we don't. What we landed on is what called covenant relationships. And if you've been around for a while, you've heard about those. And there's a, you know, brochure back here that talks all about it. Uh, and realistically, if you look at it, it's probably just a difference in terminology if you're doing church right. I don't care if you have membership or covenant relationships. But if you say, you know, I've been coming here for a while and this is my church. This is what God's called me to be, because I am a big believer in the local body church. 
That doesn't mean that we don't have the church as a whole. You know, when we talk about being collaborative, we need to look at the church as a whole working together. We need to look at networking and working with ministries and help ministries like Leapin and the, you know, with the food pantry and Voice of Hope. Absolutely. But today we're focused on the local church. And when we look at the local church, it basically says if, if everybody walks in those doors, nice new doors. Thank you very much, Brent. Um, when they walk in, this is what we commit ourselves as a church for each every person that walks in here. But if you decide this is my church, once you start having that, that word in your head, those two words, my church, in your mind, then it might be time to start praying about covenant relationship and what that looks like and what the body is expecting out of that. And it has things like we do expect that we're going to give financially into the ministry. We do expect that we're going to volunteer into that community. It ha- we do expect you're going to invest in community more than Sunday morning. That you, at least a, a home group or another way that you're getting to know other people. One of the things I love hearing right now is when somebody switches from one gathering to the next, and we're, I'm going to hear this a lot when we go back to one gathering. There's just so many people I didn't know. That's a great start. Now go get to know them. Now be in community. Now let's get to back together like we were before, <laughs> getting to know each other. There's an expectation that you're praying for the ministry of this church and the leaders of this church. There's an expectation that you are taking and welcoming people when they come and you're inviting people to come with you because we do the Great Commission. And all that is in there, not because Tom wants all that, not because we want to drag all that from everybody. It's because scripturally that's what's expected of us. And when one of us does not do that, then the church is weaker for it. When we take a look at like a seven or eight things and we slap them up on a board and say, okay, well, you know what, right now, I'm just really kind of struggling financially, so I, I, I really, I'm not going to give, but I mean, I'm going to volunteer. I, I hear the conversation a lot, and quite, quite frankly, that's the house I was raised in. We were, we were pretty tight financially. We did not have much money in any way, shape, or form. And the pastor even told my mom, well, if you just don't have money, just, just volunteer. The problem I have, even though I appreciate the heart of it, is there's nothing the Bible says, here's eight or nine things or whatever it is. Pick three. Pick three, whichever ones are comfortable for you to do, and then the rest, just don't worry about it. You'll get there. God's higher bow is that we are fully obedient to him. He says, if you love me, then obey my commands. That's what we're looking at. And when any of us fall short in not doing any of it or taking a picking and choosing what we do, the church ministry is weaker for it. Does that make sense? When I say church ministry, again, that doesn't mean that Tom's not getting to do what Tom wants to do. That means we as a body are weaker for it. Still with me? Go with me if you would to Revelations 3. I know we're just slamming through this, and this might not even be a long week, but I really think there's just something here that the Spirit's doing. I guess it should go long and give Ray his money. It's worth I'm sorry. Ray didn't even hear me. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay, baby. I love you. When we... Let me just give you a little bit of history. When we started the church, again, it's been a little over 10 years ago. It's about 11 years ago we started the plant team, which is uh, Jenny and myself and Steve and Katie, uh, Tina and Melissa, and then later on Steve, uh, Ruth. And we, and we planned, planned, the, planned it. It was really based off of certain voices. <laughs> And this is one of them. This is one of the ones that really stood out to us. And here's how it came up. Um, When we were starting the Shepherd's Fellowship originally, if you don't know this, I worked on it for about seven months and did all the things that the church books tell you to do. You know, the church leadership team. We worked on demographics. We looked at finances. We looked at supporters. looked at how to build a team, all that fun stuff. And it it was a really exciting time. And then in one particular weekend, uh, God just shut every door on it and just completely shut it down. Completely shut it down. Uh, and then uh, through this voice here, it actually within just about 24 hours switched because of something my wife said to the, the Shepherd's Nook. And within a couple months we opened Shepherd's Nook and then a year and a half later the church started by accident from our perspective, not God's. Here's the thing, and, and I just want to admit this because I, I'm seeing this in different areas too. I really believe God shut it down, not because he didn't want the Shepherd's Fellowship, but because my heart was not right in any way, shape, or form on it. I wanted to do what God wanted to do, but to be honest, I was frustrated at the church I was before. There was a lot of hurt, there was a lot of pain during that time, and I could show them how to do it right. That was my thought. That was my thought process. And God said, no, that's going to be bad. (laughs) That's going to be bad. And so he had to work that out of me. 
and he did over those years. But here's, here's the spoke, and I just want to say that because I, th I think it's important that we always have that out there. But this is the scripture that we were studying with the youth group at the church I was at before. When we were going through that time where everything got shut down, and uh, the best way I can describe it is it felt like Abraham over Isaac with the knife going, what do you mean you don't want me to do this? You made me go through all this work, all this stress, to get, you know, faithfulness, and now you don't want me to do it. And we're with the youth group, and we're studying the, the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation. And what's u unique about this, and this is one of those letters, uh, and uh, let me back up just in case you're not familiar. John was an apostle of Jesus. Um, he was the only one that died a natural death. Everyone else was martyred for, for the faith, but he didn't die uh, comfortably. He was arrested and uh, sent to an island called Patmos, which uh, you remember when we were in school and they talked about Australia, it was an island they sent all the criminals to. And then now it's a lovely place to vacation. Um, that's what Patmos was. They sent all the prisoners there, anybody they didn't want to deal with. So John basically got sent with murderers and rapists and all these people they didn't want to deal with. And pretty much probably thought he was done. I can't do ministry anymore. I've got you know, these guys around me. I'm old. What can I do now? And he got the biggest vision that he ever had in his life where God gave him the book of Revelations for you and I, talking about some things that are now our past, some things that are now present, and some things that are now our future. And within that, as he started out, God gave him, or dictated out through angels, seven letters to seven different churches that were real churches during John's time about situations they were going through that was valid and needed to go out. The thing that's cool about the Bible, especially Revelation, is a lot of it is also symbolic. It talks about other things as well and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And one of the benefits that you and I have 2,000 years later is that we see that when we look at the church age, the time that Jesus ascended into heaven, to the time he comes back, that in this exact order of these churches, exact order, we have gone through these exact same seasons in this order. Like there was a period of time that we were dealing with the same things as the Church of Philadelphia. There was a, times where we were dealing with all these different, different things built on top of each other. And right now, you and I are living in the last one. You and I are living in the age of, the, of Lady Asia, the Church of Lady Asia. And so when we read this letter here in a moment, just get excited because he's writing this to you and I. And it's a little challenging, but there's also a ton of hope. And I want to use it as a, uh, as a guide as maybe we do a little bit of self-evaluation of where we're at today, two months later, after we've been talking about mobilizing for Jesus Christ. Verse 14, chapter 3 of Revelation. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write this, these are the words of the Amen. In other words, the so shall it be. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of God's creation. He says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you would either be cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy for me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and solve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. As we get started into this, that's kind of a, a heavy little voice. <laughs> And I really don't think, if we're going to be honest, that it's all that hard to see how it applies to our lives and to our culture, at least in this country. Where we say, I mean, like the, the, the area of Lady Asia, they had, uh, there was a very important trade route that, they, that everybody thing had to go through those sections. So they had a lot of money. Solve was one of the main things that they, they had as far as uh, for the body. They, they were just uh, were rich people. They were comfortable people. They had things going just fine. And this is what he's speaking into. And quite frankly, for most of us, we're in that boat, and quite frankly, I would say all of us are in that boat, where we have the basic things that we need, things are good, things are going along, and if I look at what God's calling me to do versus what I'm doing in my daily life, I'd have to admit, there's times I'm just then not comfortable. And I think things are fine. My family's taken care of well enough. We love each other. We hang out together. You know, maybe I'm working on a savings account. The job's a little annoying at times, but I've got a job. Moving forward, things are okay. And God says, man, it's a very dangerous place to be. You ever read the scripture where it tell, tells us when you feel like you, you're strong, 
really watch out because that's more than likely when you're going to fall. And he says, man, we got to wake up outside these comfort zones. We got to wake up outside of these areas where we think everything's fine. And, I, and I'm going to church on Sunday and I like my home group and I go do my job and everything's just fine. But I'm not putting myself out there in a way that actually is leading people to the Lord that's taking and discipling each other. I'm not putting myself out there in a way that I'm letting other people be close enough to me so that when I'm messing up that they can take and say, hey, I love you, but the alcohol's killing you, man. But that relationship is not putting you in a place where God can give you his fullest and his best, and that's what I want for you. We've got to take and let ourselves be shaken. And he's like, if you continue this path, it's disgusting to me. Do you hear God say that? As we talk about his patience and just how patient he is with us, and he just rolls with us, and up he carries me like in my footsteps in the beach and all that kind of stuff, and that's great, and he's a patient, loving God. But to him, it's disgusting that we're playing games. It's disgusting that we're living life and not coming together to lead others away from hell and into a relationship with him. It's disgusting to him. He, I, I'm ready to spit it out. And if we look at this from a standpoint of where we've been in the last couple of months, there's areas we're struggling. There's areas where we're talking about being mobilized and everybody's like, yeah, let's like that sucker on Facebook. But we're struggling. When we talk about some of those different areas, I mean, uh, God, God, obviously God's blessed us through people's, through certain people's faithfulness to be able to do the things that are going on here physically. That's great. But at the same standpoint, this, is, this month of May is the second month in the world where we have dropped. And last month we dropped big when it comes to our finances and people being financially faithful. There are some people that have stopped giving. There are some people who have pulled back that has taken and, and affected things. It makes us weaker for it. When we pull back, any one of us, it makes the body as a whole weaker. You remember that? You know, leaping, uh, well, I guess we're not calling it, well, not leaping. Lamb's End is what we used to call it with the kids' ministry. One of the things that I, I love, and we went to two services, and I can't wait to go back to one service, but if God wants, he's going to take us back to two services again. But at this point, we've proven we can do it. Right? Everybody comes together and we get it done, except for in the kids' ministry. I would have loved to have the kids' ministry in both gatherings. Couldn't happen. We didn't have enough volunteers. That's the only thing that stopped it. In the last two months, and I, I understand that some, some of these uh, reasons behind it are, are unavoidable, and some of them maybe not, but we've had more people drop out of leadership in the kids' barn. And to my knowledge, my wife can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think anybody has stepped in in the last two months. And again, I understand some of the reasons, but it doesn't make and change the fact that that ministry is now weaker for it. We have more people coming, no one new stepped up, other people have stepped out. That's a concern. Mission team, you know, people going to Haiti. I'm, I'm pumped beyond belief that we have 10 people going to Haiti. And in all honesty, I've said, my goal was to see if three people would go. Having 10 go is awesome. Awesome. And they're pumped up. And some of these guys took huge faith steps financially to be able to pull this off. And some of them got together. A few of those people got together. And they've been doing fundraising as a team for the team as a whole, including like the movie night. Do you remember the movie night a couple, about three weeks ago that we had? And they, they took it and they went out and get, they got donations for snacks and they found the movie and they worked with me and have it open and everything else ready to go. We had the same 10 people show up to that that we always have show up to that. And they all just went, oh. and that took a little you know, air out of their, their excitement. But it's not going to stop them. They're still going to go. But these are the chances we have as a body to come together and there's areas we're struggling in. There's areas that we're lukewarm. And there's areas that our numbers match up to any other church, any other place. And like I said before, I don't care what it matches up to other churches. It matters whether or not we're matching up to God's expectation. So look at this as the rest of this. This is the part where it gets exciting. This is the part where we've been talking about mobilize. In 19, you might feel a little beat up by what I just said. Uh, if you don't, then hopefully it's because you didn't deserve it. If you did deserve it, I hope that changes and you feel beat up because this is where the power is. So verse 19, God says, Those who I love, I reprove and I disciple, so be zealous and repent. He goes, Because I love you, I will make you feel challenged and I will show you what disgusts me because I want better for you in the world. So don't hold on to it like it's a big guilt thing and take it home with you. Repent. Let it go. Because... Behold, verse 20, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in, 
to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All of us have seen this picture probably in some Christian bookstore or somebody's house where Jesus is standing knocking at a door and we, always, you know, we know that scripture. If you open the door, I'll come and eat with you. That's exciting. It's cool. But the problem is most of us consider that as something he's saying to people who don't know him. You know what I mean? Like I, when I was raised, I was, if you don't know Jesus, he stands at the door and knocks. And if you just open that door, that's not what this scripture says. That's true, but it's not what this scripture says. What this scripture says is, hey, Christians, stop being lukewarm. You disgust me because I want better for you in the world. And I want to challenge you with that, and I want you to come repentance in that. And if you do, then open your ears up and hear. I'm knocking at your door saying you can have a different life. You can have a more impactful life. You guys can come together and you can be a church that makes a difference in the way that we've been praying to make a difference. So if you open the door, man, I'll come right back in there and you and I are going to jam at the dinner table. Right? You and I, I, I I'm ready to go. If you're ready to go, God, I, I'm right here. Jesus said, I'm ready to go. I'm knocking at the door of the church. Again, nice new doors, but it's nothing but a building if we don't open the door and say, Jesus, can you come in here and use us because we want to follow you. We want to make a difference for you. And he promises if we say that and we believe it, he'll do it. He'll do it if we stop being lukewarm. We got to get hot, man. Not just hot. (laughs) Hot for the Lord, right? What's the laughter? You guys are messing me up. Over the last two months, I am thrilled to tell you that we have some people within the church who are giving for the first time and making faith steps. I'm also thrilled to tell you that many of our consistent givers are still giving and they don't get celebrated enough. TSF kids and youth have great leaders investing in our kids and our teens and doing incredible work, not the future of our church, but our present church that they're doing. TSF youth is growing and had 17 kids. Am I remembering 17 kids this past week. Where just two years ago, we didn't even know if we still had a youth group or not. One of our kids this week, just to celebrate, gave her testimony about being bullied in front of the entire group. If that's not enough, she also included in that testimony about the times that she bullied others. That takes honesty. That takes strength. She has a good days and bad days, but man, she just really leans into it. And you want to know it's really crazy? Mike was sharing this with me. She invited one of the kids that she bullied to be there so she can give her testimony in front of them. The building's moving. The writers group meets next week. We have six baptisms this week because Nick Hunley is also leaning into the Lord. And again, there's plenty of room in the water if you've accepted Jesus to leave and forgive your life to jump in there too. We have a couple new people joining in at Leaping and volunteering there. We have a couple new people volunteering at the food pantry from the church. At Voice of Hope, since they've been here, uh, Sivvy has been volunteering down there. has been going through training so that she can work with other young ladies that are going through tough situations with pregnancies. Uh, Jenny is taking and working with them as far as some uh, Spanish-speaking um, clients who do not speak English. So she's being a part of that ministry as well, and that's moving forward. Had a great time at a home group cookout for some great fellowship. I've seen home group celebrations, including the suave Gary Hunley last week, for who's those who are here, who walked around shaking hands with the people that make a difference, and Darcy's uh, testimony that she put on Facebook of what her home group means to her. Uh, the card night and the movie night put together raised $150. That's 10% of one person's trip to Haiti that people have been investing into. Our first kid is going to church camp this year, which thrills me to no end. We're seeing some movement in mission funds uh, as far as people taking and supporting others. If, if you've not jumped on the website and supported somebody going to Haiti, I encourage you to do so if you have those resources uh, as far as the offerings are concerned. But last week we got a check from one family for $1,000 to help somebody go to Haiti. They came through this church. Brenda Hudnall has friends that are taking and helping her fundraising and are supporting her as well. There's some new steps just within the last couple of weeks, some real faith steps there. TSF Youth decided out of their youth fund, instead of just more pizza parties and going to concerts, those type of things, they made the decision a couple months, uh, about a month ago, a month and a half ago, to support the, the three teen missionaries, $150 each, 
towards their Haiti trip. That's all teens. Mission-wise, again, uh, you, you get rid of me for a couple of weeks, Thailand 10, going to Haiti. We're seeing new faces. We're seeing new hope. We're seeing incredible things within this church. So don't let me be a big downer on the things that are not going well. But let me be the voice of Christ through his word to you as the Spirit moves, saying, if you're not getting involved yet, you're the one that's missing out. And if you're not, so is the church because we're the weaker for it. Because at the end of this building, and as God continues to grow, and as things here, and as, as people's lives continue to grow, and as he answers these prayers to impact this community, one of two things is going to be in your future. Either you sit back and go, man, this is just really cool. This is really awesome. I like the new chair. I'm glad I don't have to pay 30 bucks for the chair because we all got one. I like seeing all these new faces. I like seeing the, the kids' ministry doing block, but I love seeing the youth group, man, just change lives and everything else. That's one option. And the other one is to say, I was part of that testimony. I was part of making that happen because I followed the Lord. Make no mistake about it. I love you. God's going to have his way. But if you are pulling back in any area, we are weaker for it. And you don't get to be part of the testimony. Now I want to be part of the testimony. You can do things I cannot do. We can do things together that none of us can do by ourselves. All to the glory of the Lord.